Hello and welcome to the November webinar presentation by the Underground Association Young Members Group. My name is Colin Sessions and I am one of the members of the UCA of SME Standing Committee. I am joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, Shannon Goff, the University Outreach Chair, Everett Litton, the Membership Chair, and Demetrio Cruscolo, the Media Chair. The UCA Young Members Group is a standing committee of the UCA of, of SME that consists of professor, professionals of all ages who strive to attract and develop engineers and construction professionals 35 and under. Each month we put on a webinar of various tunneling topics available to all interested parties. Before we begin today's webinar, I have a quick announcement. We will not be hosting a webinar next month in December due to the holidays, so our next webinar will take place January 31st. Uh, Jason Edberg from NTH Consultants will be presenting, and he will present on the OMID Rehabilitation Project, which won the Trenchless Technology Rehabilitation Project of the Year in 2016. So that should be a pretty interesting presentation. Today, Dr. A Axel Neitschke will be presenting on Chakri for Underground Applications. Axel has more than 20 years of experience in wide-ranging aspects of tunneling, including design, management, QAQC, safety, and construction. During his career, he has gained particular experience in conventional tunneling and the new Australian tunneling method, which he also has experience with tunnel boring machines. He has applied different tunneling methods and ground improvement measures in ground conditions ranging from soft ground to hard rock. His work includes road, rail, and utility, utility tunnels in highly congested urban areas and remote conditions, as well as on mining projects. Axel has held key positions including SEM manager, contract claim manager, risk manager, project manager, and project and shift engineer on tunneling projects in North America, South America, and Europe. His practical experience builds on a solid scientific knowledge of tunneling, which he gained during his graduate and postgraduate studies as a research assistant at Bochum University in Germany in the area of fiber reinforced concrete. He is a registered professional engineer in several states, including California, Maryland, Virginia, Washington, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia, and is a member of the Board of Directors and the Chair of the Underground Committee uh, for the Shotcrete Association, American Shotcrete Association, and a member of ACI committees 506 and 544. Axel, thank you for presenting for us today, and when you're ready, please begin. Colin, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, I'm presenting today on behalf of the uh, American Shotcrete Association, so I want to take a few minutes to basically um, introduce the, the American Shot Grid Association, which is an, an industry association. So the vision of the American Shot Grid Association is basically that to um, that structures built or repaired with the shot grid process are accepted as equal or superior to superior to cast concrete. So you will hear that probably during the presentation a few more times, you know the, the slogan shot grid is concrete want to basically, um, that is the mission to to show that shotcrete is simply a different method of placing concrete. So in, with that, our mission is to basically provide resources, uh, certification, training, and education in this area um, for the acceptance, quality, and safe practices of the shotcrete process. And this webinar is is basically right right within this mission. So. Um, you know, we created this this webinar uh, in the underground committee to do exactly that. Um, a wonderful resource for short grid related uh, questions is is the ASA homepage www.shotgrid.org. Um, I recommend to to just hoover through that, or if you're looking for specific information there. Um, the A uh, American Short Grid Association is almost 20 years old next year, so we will have our first Short Grid Convention and Short Grid Technology Conference in Napa in March. So if you're interested to join us there, that would be great. And uh, <clears throat> you can also subscribe for the free Short Grid magazine where you basically get information um, on a monthly basis there. Um, I'm with WSP USA, Tunnel Practice Leader NATM. 
and that is basically um, my connection to to Shortgrid. I did most of my jobs using SEM, and then you have Shortgrid basically there as as the key structure material. Um, as Colin said, it you know I'm I'm chair of the underground committee. They are also on the board of directors of ASA, but also within the ACI committees for Shortgrid and Fiber Reinforced Concrete. So now for this introduction, okay, all the entire uh, um, presentation is, is copyrighted material. That's just a legal disclaimer here. Um, Shortgrid for underground applications, an introduction to ACI 5.6.5, guide for specifying underground shortgrid. The, uh, the scope or the idea that we had in the underground committee was to provide newcomers to shortgrid um, in, in for tunnel or mining applications to basically provide a door opener. I think you have the guide for specifying underground shortgrid um, and you don't get around of, of reading and, and working with it, but the idea the idea was basically to provide you know a, a first step into it, you know to to basically tear down this barrier so um, that you basically are not afraid or or hesitant to use short read. So in the middle, in the center, you have that is how the the guide for specifying underground short read looks like. Um, on the left, you see ACR 546R16. That's the guide to short grid. That's also a very good document if you if you're starting with short grid or if you if you need a reference for for short grid related um, aspects. And then you on the right you have the more general guide. You know, short grid is is not just used in tunneling. I think uh, what I've learned since I'm with ASA that uh, I'm pretty tunnel focused um, <laughs> with that regard. Um, but uh, there are also tons of other other uh, very interesting applications. So the the guide on the right is is much more for the general applications. So there comes to the question: So what is short read? If you look at the ACI uh, terminology, it's defined there as concrete placed by a high velocity. Uh, a high velocity pneumatic projection from a nozzle. So what what does it mean? Um, it basically means that short grid is just a different method of placing concrete. Important hereby is that it's projected with a high velocity because you need the high velocity to basically provide impact energy when it hits the surface to compact the material. And that is basically what the high velocity does. That provides you the the um, compaction that you otherwise get uh, by cast and place concrete by vibrating it, for example. So we have two major processes in, in short grid. The one is called the dry mix process, and the other one is the wet mix process. Um, if I want you to basically take away three things from from this webinar. It's basically the first what we talked about first that short grid is concrete, and that you have a basic understanding of what the difference between dry mix and wet mix is. So in a in a wet mix process, you are providing a keen dry material into the short grid gun, and it is then propelled by compressed air through the hose to the nozzle, and the nozzle man adds the water to the mix, right? And then you, it basically it, it mixes with the water in the nozzle and then is projected against the wall. So it's called dry mix because the material that you're putting into your short grid gun is, is dry while it's conveyed through the hose. The wet mix process uses, let's say, complete ready mix concrete. So the water and all the ingredients are already in the mix, and then you are pumping the concrete through the hose, through the nozzle. So in the dry mix process, you have basically the, the uh, dry mix flying through the air, while in the wet mix process, you have the wet concrete in the hose. When it hits the nozzle, you are adding compressed air, and the compressed air is then propelling 
uh, the, the material um, against the, the wall. So that is basically the, the, the general difference. So with the wet mix process, you are adding the air at the nozzle and potentially accelerate, and I talk about that a little bit later. But in the dry mix process, you are adding the water at the nozzle. So short grade applications, well, <clears throat> where are you use or for what can you use the uh, short grade in underground applications? Um, I personally have, have spent most of, of my career in, in civil tunneling. Um, another big area of underground short grade application is mining. And it's used there also widely, but uh, basically also for different purposes or with a different mindset. You can use it as, an, as a temporary or permanent support. Even in civil tunnel lining, it's, it's used more and more frequently also for final linings. Um, if you accelerate it, especially for the initial lining, it provides high early strength. That provides you increased safety for, for underground openings. Um, uh, especially in mining, you, you know, it's, the, you have re-entry times and until nobody is, is allowed, for example, to, to work on unsupported ground. Um, and the high early strength is, is a big factor uh, of basically a, allowing uh, access in there. Um, it decreases labor and time for ground support, especially if you use a, a robot like shown on, in this picture here. And I think the other big item there is it provides you a lot geometrical and operational flexibility. That basically means you can, you can basically create whatever geom geometry or, or shape you want or intersections, and you can work on and off uh, uh, applying short feet basically whenever you like, um, and that provides you a lot of operational flexibility. If you talk, if you look at uh, ground support systems, I think there there are three three different elements how short grid is used for, for structural purposes. The first one is to seal off the rock surface to prevent deterioration. Um, so you typically have a relatively thin layer, one to two inches, uh, and it just, as the word says, seals off the surface. The second one is when you, the primary structure member are rock bolts or lattice girders or steel sets, and the short grid just bridges between them, basically collects the, collects the load and transfers them to the main structural item. You have a typical um, thickness here is three to five inches. If you're moving more to weaker ground or soft ground, you are creating a shot grid arch, so the shot grid itself builds an arch and it becomes the main structure member, and then you talk about thicknesses between 6 to 12 inches. Critical items uh, for underground applications, especially in, in poor ground conditions, you should apply the shot grid immediately after excavation. Um, prefer, preferably, if you, especially if you have large tunnels with a robotic arm, so to avoid that, that anybody has to walk under unsupported ground. Um, you want to basically bond the short grid with the, with the substrate, with the, with the rock, interlocking it. Um, <clears throat> therefore, you, you want to avoid delamination between the rock. That may require that you that you scale the surface uh, or, or clean it from debris and so forth before you apply short grid. Um, and then the other critical item, especially if you, if you are in the drill and blast uh, tunnel, is overbreak. The big strength of short grid is that you can basically follow the, um, <clears throat> follow the rock surface as it is. But if you have, let's say, a steel set or a lattice girder, you have a given geometry, and you have to bring the profile back and have potentially substantial volume of shot grid to basically backfill this overbreak. So here are a few pictures of, of basically um, how shot grid is used underground. So the first one is initial support here in a rock tunnel. So you see a, a relatively irregular surface there in the crown. 
primary support is probably with, with rock bolts. Um, this shows an application for final lining with, with lattice girders and rebar. Um, another big big uh, field for short read underground applications that you know if, if you work in in new tunnel design and construction, which you may forget, is all the remediation and repair application for short read. Um, you can install short grid on a PVC waterproofing membrane. I think there are certain challenges, but they, they can be faced. Um, and these are pictures from, from large station or powerhouse caverns, for example. These are example for, examples for challenging geometry, especially if you have intersections you know, for a cross passage or an edit or something, which are very labor intensive if you want to uh, build it with a classical format poor approach. <coughs> you can also in, uh, create uh, walls, especially if they are inside the tunnel where you have problems of of let's say filling them. So you have to form it from one side and basically apply the short read from the other side. So overall with this presentation we are basically following the structure of the guide. So there are certain sub chapters. For example, I'm moving now on into the materials chapter. If you if you want to basically um, afterwards study some, some areas a little bit more, you just pick up the guide and basically follow, follow along there. <coughs> so the materials of Shotgreed are exactly the same than the, than the material specifications for concrete because, and you have heard it before, Shotgreed is concrete. So using all basically the, the, the uh, typical standards for cement, aggregates, admixtures, water, fibers, you name it. Um, for cement, you typically use use one, two, or three type cements. Um, I talk a bit, little bit about silica fume uh, in in a few uh, seconds here because that's frequently used. Um, you use also fly ash or slag cement. Um, the aggregates, since you have to convey it through a hose, you basically want to have a have a nice grading, typically a, a number two uh, grading curve, and you limit the size of the maximum uh, aggregate. So three, uh, typically to three eighths of an inch or uh, ten millimeters nominal maximum size. Simply, if you have larger gravels, you you can have you can basically plug the uh, the short grid hose. Mixing water, there are no, no special requirements there. Um, and then I will talk a little bit more about uh, all kinds of chemical admixtures. But in the big picture, at the end of the day, uh, sh the, the short grid is a standard, uh, standard concrete. So silica fume, silica fume are very, very fine particles. On the upper right side, you see an, an, an basically the, the scale of, of a silica fume particle versus a cement grain. It's roughly ten times, a uh, hundred times smaller than a, than a Portland cement grain. So with that, what what it basically does is it provides uh, it provides smoothness and stickiness to the material. Why do we want that? If you go to the plastic properties, it basically approves the adhesion. So if we apply it overhead or vertically, it sticks better. Um, it increases the, the cohesion. Uh, that allows us to build up thicker layers in one run, especially when we are play playing overhead before it falls down. It reduces rebound. Rebound is the material that <coughs> that you shoot against a surface and then basically bounce back, which does not become a, a part of the of the structure. So rebound is basically waste material, and you want to reduce the the amount of rebound. Um, it also, with the stickiness, improves the washout resistance. So let's say if you apply it on a rock or <coughs> or ground surface. It, it cannot be washed out that easily. 
It also improves uh, the the hardening properties. It basically uh, improves the the strength. And since it is uh, provides a lot of fine material, it um, it uh, improves the the or reduces the porosity and, and makes it less permeable. And with that come come a lot of um, uh, other resistance uh, uh, properties that are improved. I briefly talked about accelerators, um, especially for the initial lining. Um, what accelerators does, they basically in, increase the time for the cement to set, so you get more strength earlier. Um, so with that, it um, you don't have to, let's say, to wait that long and still you, you have structural capacity, but it also allows you basically to, to uh, increase the build-up thickness uh, and so forth. Um, controlling the inflow water, yeah, if I talk a little bit about groundwater control and, and um, applying shotgreed on water, if you have water accelerator also supports basically that. Accelerators in dry mix short grid are typically added in, in, uh, in powder form directly into the mix. Uh, and with wet mix short grid, they are added typically in the airstream, so right at the nozzle. Hydration stabilizers. Oh, I, I hear an echo there, sorry. Um, if you could just Put your your, uh, your mics on mute there, mic please. Mute so the hydration. The hydration stabilizers basically do exactly the opposite than the accelerators do. The accelerators uh, um, speed up the the uh, hardening process of the cement and the hydration stabilizers basically put the put the mix at sleep. Why do we want that? Uh, because if, if you have, let's say, a tunnel project in an urban area like New York and you have restrictions in delivery time, you want to be able to store the material on site. Or if you are in a mining environment and you have simply a lot of, a long way to transport the stuff. So you basically put the put the concrete asleep and then if you start pumping it you uh, adding accelerator and basically reversing the the retarder effect. Air entrainment uh, is an issue if you if you want to have more free thaw uh, uh, resistance. Um, there's one just uh, one item. Basically, during the short grid process, you are reducing some of the air entrainment simply due to the process. So keep in mind that. The air entrainment at the place short grid is reduced uh, than in the original mix. We also use air entrainment to basically increase pumpability. We use all kinds of uh, fibers, um, steel fibers, macrosynthetic fibers, both for structural uses, uh, microsynthetic fibers, primarily for crack control, um, in uh, final linings also for fire resistance. Um, what I'm seeing is is that basically for initial linings, it's the the use of fibers is more and more increased because you have basically adding or or reducing uh, the the operation of the mining process about one step, namely the the uh, installation of of reinforcement. But that really depends on on the the structure used in the design. Talking about reinforcement and anchorage. If you use welded wire fabric, uh, make sure that it's uh, that it's not vibrating, that it's uh, uh, tight tied to either lattice girder or the rock bolts. Because if you want to embed the rebars <coughs> full into the concrete matrix, and if they are vibrating during the process, you are basically disturbing this bond there. Um, you have a typical mesh of, of four by four inches or six by six. Don't go smaller because you have to shoot the material 
through the openings of the mesh. Um, keep in mind that uh, somebody has to install the mesh and that you have round surfaces, so don't use too stiff or too heavy uh, uh, mesh because it's simply difficult to handle. Um, if you have two layers of reinforcement at the extra dose and the intra dose, keep in mind that they both have to embed it properly. So um, that's a, a question whether you in install one layer first, shoot that, and then the second layer afterwards, or whether you want to shoot through two layers of, of uh, WWF, which can be a, a challenge. That is basically how it, how it looks like. This in a, in a small culvert uh, environment. Um, rock bolts, you, especially in mining, you very often have the, the rock bolts tying the mesh directly on the surface and then you covering them afterwards with shot read. Um, so here it's, it's again, um, everything becomes basically one, one unit. Um, steel sets, um, you basically have two, two different applications here with Shotgrid. You are either embedding the steel sets completely into Shotgrid or you're just installing the, um, the uh, Shotgrid between two steel sets to basically bridge between them. Um, the other purpose of short grid is simply to to close the gap between the steel sets and the rock surface to to allow for load transfer. Lattice girders uh, have a similar function than, than steel sets, but they are um, much lighter and they will be uh, they are completely embedded in the short grid. Um, they look like rebar. They probably also uh, act like a, like a rebar reinforcement. However, typically the spacing from girder to girder uh, is so so far that you uh, typically cannot um, cannot use them in a structural design because the the um, the distance between the two rebar sets of two lattice girders does not uh, does not allow you to lose it as rebar if you if you're following ACI 318 for example. Mixture proportioning. Um, what's typically, especially in, in large jobs, you want to make sure that that everything is working smoothly if you start the job. So. Uh, and you don't want to find out that it's not working while you're looking at an open face or have just excavated a challenging section. So you do a lot of pre-construction trials and the trial batching is, is basically one of them. Unless you have um, historical submittals, you know, let's say you have, have built something in the area, you use the same mix and so forth, and then you're pretty certain that this mixture is working. Um, there's one thing, um, if you have a mixture proportioning, let's say, in the, in, the batched, uh, in the batched mix, however, we talked briefly about rebound, and what happens is that basically the larger aggregates are proportionally, that you have larger proportion of large aggregates in the rebound than smaller. So you have basically a shift in the mixture proportions between the batched material and the installed material, and as happens uh, especially in dry mix shotcrete. Um, you have the same effect also with uh, steel fibers. So let's say you're putting whatever number of pounds per cubic yards in your mix, potentially you have more fibers in the rebound than in the installed, uh, than at the uh, then add installed in the wall. Um, mixture proportionings for dry mix. So you um, keep in mind that the nozzle man puts the water at the nozzle into the mix. So you are not under control. In the, you know uh, uh, you're targeting uh, between a, a water cement ratio between 0.35 or 0.45. Uh, so um, but the nozzle man basically ultimately controls that. Um, 
and you want to have, as we talked before, a relative smooth grading curve. This is an example. This is not the ultimate dry mix mix or the best mix or the cheapest or whatever. It is just an example to give you an idea. Um, and you have basically all the standard ingredients of concrete in there. You have water, you have sand, you have, of course, uh, material. The only special here is that you may or may not add silica fume for dry mix. Uh, for wet mix, the biggest driver here is you have to pump the mix, and pumpability becomes a big, big issue. So you still want to have a, uh, again, you want to have a, um, a smooth grading curve. Uh, you have relatively uh, a relatively high amount of cementitious material, so that's cement, uh, but also silica fume or, or fly ash and whatnot. Uh, and with that, that typically requires a lot of water if you still want to have it pumpable, but you cannot add the water because otherwise the water cement ratio becomes out of range. So what you're doing there is you use all kinds of, of water reducers, potentially air entrainment and so forth. Um, so and then the mix uh, the mixture becomes let's say more complicated. So that's a that's a example for wet mix proportions. So you again have the standard concrete ingredients, water, cement, sand, coarse aggregates, uh, silica fume here as well, but you also see at the bottom all kinds of admixtures added to the mix. Performance requirements. You know, this, this is an, um, a selection basically based on, on the guide. Um, but it really depends on the application, right? If you if you have a final lining uh, application, if you have a rehabilitation, you um, you want to have uh, a different uh, different requirements, performance requirements. Let's say than for an initial lining, right? For an initial lining, you you might want to have toughness or high early strength. But uh, for a rehab job, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, so that is why I don't want to go into too much details. That really depends on your actual design and what performance you really need. Quality assurance, quality control. Uh, if you are on the owner side, um, I think the, you should definitely require uh, Submittals from the contractor that you should review for the materials, the supply, equipment, and the crew. Uh, most important here is the nozzleman, so you should, um, there's an ACI nozzleman certification, so uh, you should definitely require that the nozzleman is certified. Um, on site, you should, should examine and approve the substrate before you shotcrete, because afterwards it is too late. You know, if you have delamination or, or debris still on it, you should inspect and monitor the shotcrete installation while uh, the material is installed, because the the process itself uh, has a big influence on the on the final quality of the material. You should monitor the results with ongoing testing of, uh, of uh, um, soft as well as, as hardening uh, uh, performance. Um, and you should also implement a program, program for acceptance and re rejection of installed shot -free. With that, you have to clearly define what is defective shot -free. When do you reject it? Under which conditions? How you measure it? And then, of course, you should have a program for remedial work in place. On the contractor side, quality control. Um, the contractor should have a should have a quality control plan to show that he can ensure compliance with the contract documents, um, and then maintain rock records of the entire operation. So batch delivery time, discharge time. Uh, batch proportions, where was it installed, special precautions for if it's hot or cold water, uh, whether if you have flowing groundwater or whatever, and the nozzleman who has basically performed the work. 
submittals. Um, if you want to have to specify submittals, these three guides here provide you valuable information, basically how to do them, what to request, how the language looks like, and so forth. Um, the purpose and the contents of the submittals is basically that the that the contractor demonstrates that he knows and understands what he's doing, that he's capable of doing it, that he that he knows what the requirements are, and uh, that he provides you uh, evidence that he has done something similar before, that he's capable of doing it. Um, for example, if somebody is, is has used uh, success uh, has used shotweed successful to build uh, uh, skate parks in in California or wherever that doesn't necessarily mean that he's also capable of, uh, of spraying uh, shotweed in an underground environment you know where the shotweed is accelerated where you spray overhead and so forth so that is basically on a higher level the purpose of the submittals um, other things you should pay attention to is that the contractor has has a long and successful history. It just it didn't just start yesterday of doing short weight. Um, that he has done successfully done similar projects. Uh, so you should check that with references. So with uh, projects of similar size and complexity or whatever phrase you want to use, um, you should ask for the for the work history of the key personnel, that's primarily the nozzleman and the supervisors, um, that the nozzleman has the required experience and skill, and you should definitely check that he's ACI certified for the method that you want to apply. So there are different certifications for dry or wet shot grid, and also for vertical and overhead orientation. Reconstruction trials and testing. What you do very often is uh, you have pre-construction testing and you use uh, full-size mock-ups where you basically uh, build a mock-up of critical sections of the structure, maybe overhead or if you have areas with uh, congested reinforcement and so forth. Um, so the contractor basically proves and tests his equipment and his skills that he's basically uh, capable of doing it. It also allows you to uh, potentially do final adjustments before you go live into the real real project. Um, keep in mind that the amount of pre-construction testing and panels and mock-ups uh, should, should be in relation to the size and the complexity of the project. So if you have a relatively small rehabilitation job, you definitely don't want to have a, a big uh, testing program However, if you have a 10 mile long underground job and you want to shoot, I don't know, final linings and uh, cross passages and, and whatnot, um, you probably do uh, uh, much more uh, with the with mock-ups and pre-construction testing. So these are basically examples of, of course from this from these areas. Um, if you look at the core on the right side, uh, there's something else that I want to discuss by just looking at this picture, right? Because you are, you are spraying from one end uh, and what you want to avoid are so-called spray shadows uh, behind the rebar. So you're applying shot weight from the one end, but you cannot access it from the other side. So the question is, how does the material basically fully embed the rebar there? And the answer is, while you are applying it, and while the material sticks on the wall, it is still plastic. So, and with the additional material that you are putting on top of it with high velocity, that basically drives the material and compacts it all around the rebar. That is how that works. Construction acceptance inspection. That is basically if you are if you're on the owner side. Um, and accept basically the final product. Um, you do construction testing during the placement. So look at fresh properties, slump and whatnot, temperature, 
Um, typically, you, you shoot test panels for every 50 cubic yards. Um, if you have a longer tunnel job, you know, and, and there were no issues, you, you may want to reduce that as you go along. Also, if you have just a, a smaller job, you may have uh, you may have a different testing frequency there. there. So if you're spe uh, specifying a job, keep that in mind that it has to basically be be um, in compliance with the job that you have. And then you basically pull cores afterwards. Um, you cannot apply short grid on, on flowing or running water, so um, you have to drain the water off. Otherwise, what happens, even if you are capable of building up some short grid, you are covering up the water. You have a buildup of water pressure behind the short grid, and the water pressure basically pushes the lining out and potentially uh, damages the lining or even hurts somebody. Um, you have to take cold weather precautions. So if it's too cold, you have to heat it. Uh, you have to heat the, the material. The um, specialty in tunneling is if you have, let's say, ground freezing and you apply short grid against frozen uh, surfaces, you typically have a sacrificial layer there, which structurally doesn't count. The same with hot weather. weather um, if the material is too hot, um, you basically have to cool it. Um, especially if you're using accelerator, it, it's very sensitive against the, the material of the, of the base mix. Batching, mixing, and supply. So these are basically some examples for um, material supply. Uh, you either have a ready mix plant or you mix the, the let's say, backed material on site. So you have dry backed material, but you're mixing a wet shotcrete and you're using the wet uh, shotcrete process on site. Um, or you, you basically just have a, have a feeder there for dry mix shotcrete. So that you have backed material on site does not necessarily mean that you're using the, the dry mix, shot, uh, dry mix um, process. And then if you have to transport it horizontally within the tunnel, you have typically these remixes where you just fill the material in uh, and transport it to wherever you use it. Um, dry material creates a dust. Therefore, you, are, uh, you can or should uh, pre-dampen it. So basically adding some, some water already in the mix right before you're using it um, to basically reduce the development of dust. Um, this shows some pictures of handling big bags. Um, for the placing equipment, um, we talked about the dry mix shot uh, process. Um, the key here is that you have enough air volume. So because you you have to propel the um, the material through the hose, so make sure that you have enough air um, provided. You need more air for the dry mix shot we then you use for the wet mix. Um, these are examples for uh, dry mix shot grid machines. So the rotary barrel almost looks like a like an enlarged revolver. So the material falls into, into one chamber of the revolver and then it's turned and then it's basically blown through the hose. And with a, with a uh, bowel machine, you basically have some material that, that is transferred from, from atmospheric pressure, falls into a second chamber, which is then pressurized, and then you blow the material out. Um, if you are adding the water at the nozzle, Inside the nozzle, you have the air pressure. Keep in mind that water comes out of the nozzle. You have to overcome the air pressure, so you typically need water booster pumps to provide more pressure for the water. The wet mix process, you have a short grid pump, um, and you propel it basically with the air which is added at the nozzle. Um, you have uh, a, a standard concrete pump, more or less, uh, high-pressure hoses, um, 
this gives you an, an idea of how much air, com, uh, air you need. So you have uh, less less volume than you had for the dry. Um, accelerator dosing pumps. Um, you, the accelerator is added based on uh, a percentage of the cement volume that requires that you know how much volume you are pumping. So if you have a complete shotgun robot, the two pumps, the concrete pump and the accelerator pump, are synchronized. If you do not have that, you have to do some on-site calibration before. And uh, uh, blow pipes are used basically to blow away rebound, especially if you if you're uh, applying short grid in the invert area that you don't embed rebound into the structure. So these are examples. This shows a, a wet mix pump. Uh, this shows some pictures for robotic nozzles. Um, this is some uh, short grid application for, for rehab jobs. And this is how an accelerator dosing pump, for example, looks like. These are some nozzles, dry mix nozzles at the at the left side. So you see basically the, the wheel on the valve to control the water pressure and wet mix nozzles on the right side where you basically have the air pressure uh, and potentially also the accelerator. And then you have typical air compressors on the air hoses. This is how a blowpipe on airlines looks like. There's nothing else like a like a, a, a piece of, of tube and which are flatten which are flatten uh, which is flattened on the one side. And then you just blow away all the rebound. Preparation for short greeting. Um, I think we have a little bit running out of time, so I speed up a little bit. The um, you want to have bonding or, or uh, adhesion to the substrate, so make sure that it's that it's uh, clean and, and prepared. Especially if you have uh, rear projects, you have this uh, uh, surface dry surfaces. Um, so alignment control is how does the northern man know where the where the profile is. So you can use all kinds of, of uh, uh, support here. For example, uh, piano wires are uh, basically some wires which are running along the alignment, um, or pencil rods, which are simply some rods sticking out so that you know where the final profile uh, is supposed to be. Or you have simply some formworks or guide strips installed. Curing and protection, again, Short grid is concrete, so you have to cure it. And basically, everything which applies for regular concrete also applies for short grid. So, and if you're not doing it, you get the same results than you have for regular concrete. Measurement and payment. Um, the contract is paid for the short grid in place, typically as shown on the drawings with the um, theoretical thickness. Um, so excluded for payment is material which is rebound or overbreak or losses, for example, for cleanouts. So the contractor does not get paid the the volume of material or weight of material that he delivered on site. He gets paid what is actually installed in the structure. And with that, you know, these are a few useful. References, um, as I said at the beginning, shotgrid.org, there's a buyer's guide if you use contractors, consultants, suppliers, and so forth. If you want to look up ACI certification for Nozzlemans, that's basically the home page there for the certification. Um, feel free to contact ASA staff either via email or with this phone number if you have questions. There's also, I think, a corner where you can post questions and then they will be answered. And if you have questions for ACI certification, uh, you can call them here as well. Um, these are basically the, the core American concrete guides if you're dealing with short grid. You have the guide to short grid, guide for specifying underground short grid, uh, the, the two documents that we talked about before. The uh, Craftsman Workbook, 
is, is a workbook for the short grid nozzleman certification, which explains the short grid process in really plain English. I think that's also, a, a, I like it a lot because it, it just explains you short grid with a, with a hands on approach. Uh, if you're dealing with um, fiber reinforced concrete, you have the ACI 544.3. Um, and then, of course, since short grid is concrete, you have ACI 318. Um, and with that, I'm basically in time, and we have uh, still some time for questions. With that, I would like to give it back to Jackie and Colin. Thank you, Axel. That was absolutely fascinating. We do have a number of questions. The first one is, what would be thickness, the thickness of sacrificial layer when applying shotcrete on frozen ground, and how do you determine it? <laughs> so, um, I, I, I want to weasel my way a little bit out of a hard number here. Um, the problem with, with frozen ground is basically the, the water in the mix freezes, and with that, uh, it cannot react with the cement anymore, and you don't get the, the final strength that you're looking for. Um, you know, I have, to, I have to double check if you really want to have a hard number, but I would guess that you need a few inches um, there as a sacrificial layer. Um, if you if you really want to have a hard number, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I can do some little more research. But it's it's you certainly go. you know in a, a few inches I would guess. Great, thank you. The next question is, NIOSH has performed some research on shotcrete adhesion. Adhesion. Some materials, uh, for instance, weak shale were found to be poor substitutes for adhesion, no matter how well the surface was prepared. What are your experiences with this? You know, um, so I, I, spend, I spend my career in tunneling, right? And, and the, the biggest difference from tunneling to everything else is, okay, you have to deal with what Mother Nature provides you. Um, if you don't get the adhesion to the substrate, you don't get the adhesion to the substrate. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not working anymore. You cannot just not, you cannot use it structurally, right? You're basically building a short grid layer which is not structurally connected to the substrate, but it can still work, right? It would be better, it's more effective if you have this adhesion but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If you are in doubt, um, I would conservatively assume that you don't have that connection. Right. Our next question, and we're taking them in order. When Shot Creek vendors refer to gunite, are they referring to the dry mix process versus the wet mix process? Gunite is... Uh, is um, let's say, a more historic um, uh, word. I think of a few weeks back, Charles Hanscott, the our executive director of ASA, um, had, a, had a nice webinar, and I think it's, it's recorded, so you can look at it, and I think he talks about the, the, different, the different terms there. Uh, Ghanite basically was used in the, in the early, early days. Um, it is on, on the one hand, uh, this, uh, the same term than short grid, but I think uh, historically, you know, uh, in, in the old days, there was just, uh, you primarily did dry short grid. So I think there's certainly a, a, an, an association that gunite is rather dry short grid, but it's not clearly defined. Um, so I would I would not use gunite, especially not if you the term gunite. I would use basically shotcrete, and if you the term shotcrete, and then clearly defined of what you want to have. Um, other than that, I think again, gunite not clearly defines whether it's dry or wet mix. And that is personally also my my personal opinion, right? There might be other people who, who have a much stronger association 
with dry shot read there. Great, thank you. The next question is, how do you measure rebound? <laughs> that's a that's a, a good question. So, um, if okay, I I spent I spent the five years working as a as an assistant professor in the university, right? And we also did shot grid tests and so forth. If you if you are in the research environment. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can put out a, a tarp down there in the area, uh, or you can afterwards ship it into wheelbarrow and and then weight it uh, and compare it to the to the total amount that you have delivered. Uh, then you know how much rebound you have, and the remaining material must be in the wall uh, on the wall, and with that you can basically evaluate the rebound. If you are in a real tunnel job. Uh, where the primary purpose is not to evaluate how much rebound you have, it is really tough to do, um, to get exact numbers. You can certainly eyeball it, um, you know, and you can say, oh, that's, that's certainly too much or, or too little, but if you want to have exact numbers, that is tough to get. And then you probably would do it by weight, as I said, but it's, it's labor intense. There's no no real fancy way of evaluating it. Terrific, thank you. Um, we do have time for a few more questions. The next one is, does ASA do certification for robotically applied shotcrete? Um, there is no uh, official certification. So, so there is no robotic or hand sprayed certification with ASA. So the the classical uh, uh, certification is by hand. It is either dry mix or wet, or vertical or overhead. We have discussions uh, about robotic because it certainly makes makes a difference, um, and you have more and more applications uh, in with that regard. But there is no official robotic spraying certification program in the U.S. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Axel. We are um, running close to the end of the session. I would like to comment to our attendees. You will receive a, um, a, a survey that you can fill out after the presentation where you can ask a few more questions and make a few more comments because we certainly could not get through all of the questions we had today. The, that was a, a Fantastic presentation, Axel. Would you would you have any final comments for our attendees? No, th thank you very much. You know, for giving me the opportunity presenting for for the uh, uh, UCA young members. It's it's always a, a very good opportunity. And if if I could spark the interest in short read and maybe ISA, you know, feel free to to contact us, join us, uh, or um, you know, ask us questions that you have. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. This ends today's session. Have a great day.